On this episode of the InsureTech Geek Podcast, we're talking about the top level priority for insurance CIOs in 2024 with Bill Cassidy from New York Life. The InsureTech Geek Podcast powered by JB Knowledge is all about technology that's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. We'll be interviewing guests and doing deep dives into specific tech we see changing the industry. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech, so enjoy the ride and geek out. This episode of the InsureTech Geek Podcast is sponsored by Smart Compliance, Certificate of Insurance Management and Tracking. Explore this efficient approach to compliance at smartcompliance.co. And uh, we're excited to be back here. Uh, we're launching another year of the InsureTech Geek Podcast. I'm your host and the flying solo today, Rob Galbraith. And uh, I'm thrilled to have with us uh, Bill Cassidy from New York Life. Welcome, Bill. Thank you very much for having me, Rob. So uh, so thrilled to have you on. And, and we'll definitely get into you know your current role at New York Life and kind of your outlook and, and thoughts on the role of CIO and uh, priorities and and so much obviously going on in kind of the insure tech and innovation space uh, in a few minutes. But as we typically do on the show, I really just want to start with getting to know uh, you a little bit and have you share your background and, and uh, with our guests so they can understand a little bit about yourself, your background, your career, and, and how you arrived at the position you are today. So uh, first and foremost, why don't you kind of tell us where are you coming from us today? And then, yeah. you know, where did you grow up and what did you want to do uh, for a career when you were a kid? Oh, great. Well, again, thanks very much for having me. I'm broadcasting today from our office here in New York City, um, but I live on Long Island, New York, uh, with my wife and three beautiful daughters. So blessed in that regard. Um, and surprisingly, when I was a young person, I was not aspiring to be a CIO of an insurance company. I had different aspirations. I was certainly a bit of a gym rat, Rob. I loved the game of basketball and traveled around the country and you know, was lucky enough to receive a division two scholarship and play at university. So there was a moment in time where I thought I could play professionally, but that quickly faded away in the background realizing that, you know, I just wasn't as big and strong as I should have. But to this date, I'm a very loyal New York Knicks fan. And I sort of channel that love that way. Um, in terms of my professional career, um, I've been doing this financial services and technology thing for the better part of 32, 33 years. Um, started my career in 1992 after graduating undergraduate degree in computer mathematics and economics. So I, I actually do for a living what I studied, which is sort of odd these days. Um, I started my career at Goldman Sachs, as I said, as a software engineer, um, like many early technologists. And if you go back to the early 90s, it probably wouldn't be surprising. My first foray into development was on COBOL mainframes. Um, quickly moved into more client server based applications and had the opportunity to work um, in various departments across Goldman Sachs and learn basically learn the business. Um, after about seven years there, I had a very unique opportunity to head out west and work for a small asset management company in California. Um, and everyone needs to live in California at one point in their life. So that was a fun life experience as well. Um, and after two years there, I sort of had a, one of the major parts of my career. Um, was joining BlackRock back here in New York, where I spent 15 years. Um, over that 15-year timeline, I had a multitude of roles, quasi-technology, software engineering was very critical in the Aladdin trading system development, but also focused on enterprise data at the company. And then after leaving Goldman Sachs, I had a two-year stint at a publicly traded hedge fund here in New York, which is always interesting, working at um, a hedge fund, the pace and the energy that those companies have are hard to miss. Um, and that was my first opportunity to sort of take the big seat to become a CIO um, at that hedge fund, which was a clearly a big learning. And then I joined the New York Life family in March of 2018. Um, so six years coming up. And I've been very fortunate here, Rob. I've held the multitude of posts. Um, I landed at New York Life as a divisional CIO overseeing our investments um, technology area. So our the teams that support our general account, as well as our externally facing asset management business. Um, and then after some opportunities and some other things being added to the portfolio, when my predecessor retired um, in 2021, I was named CIO. So I've been in the post now for three years or so. Um, interesting, you have this amazing career opportunity uh, handed to you. And of course, 
I was announced as a new CIO on April Fool's Day, which you really can't make up. And uh, <laughs> I guess I guess the joke is still on. I'm still here, and uh, we, we have some really great stuff happening here at New York Life. So it's uh, it's a really exciting time. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks for for yeah. walking us through that. And um, yeah, it's interesting on on basketball. My kids definitely not good enough to play in college, but my son is 19. He's a freshman at LSU, so he. Uh, he played basketball ever since he's kindergarten, and I remember he was on the uh, the B team in uh, middle school. And so, as he went to high school, you know, he wanted to play. And I told him, I was like, "Unfortunately, you've inherited my athletic genes, which means you're short <laughs> and slow and and can't jump very high. And um, you've got to be either you know tall or pretty skilled uh, to be you know good at, at at basketball." And so he really put in the work, you know, with the coach, and it eventually made it to. To varsity and that the, the team did really well now they ended up they made the playoffs but they they lost a i think it was the number three ranked team in the state of texas so at the same year the girls team won the state championship actually for the first time oh for uh, his high school yeah, yeah which is pretty pretty exciting so uh well, i tell you this, now, I, guess, this, I was going to say there's many ways that one could get it but uh you know the experience of working on a team you know it certainly translates into the professional field too so even though your son didn't make the nba and i'm sorry learn some stuff that'll help him in his future career. Well, it's interesting. So he, he, you know, he definitely still plays, you know, rec league type stuff, whatever, but he's really gotten yeah. into ultimate Frisbee uh, at it. LSU. And and so there's not a, a, you know, varsity team, but there is a club team and they play a lot of the other SEC schools. And uh, he just asked me to pay for his, his, you know, uniform. He's got a schedule to come up, whatever. So I kind of joke with uh, Jane Daniels winning the Heisman in New York city this past week, right. From the LSU quarterback, I kind of said to him like, Oh, what's the, the Heisman equivalent in ultimate Frisbee? kind of tongue in cheek and he texted back he said i think it's called the callahan i was like oh, i didn't know there was such a thing as the the heisman trophy of, of ultimate frisbee but uh, i guess, yeah, I guess so. there is yeah so anyway well um you know I, i'm curious you mentioned uh you, you're obviously kind of east coaster right grew up on long island you live on long island but you mentioned your time out west so and you mentioned kind of in passing right like it's a good experience so just quickly i would love to hear your kind of thoughts of what that experience was like and what maybe some of your key takeaways were when you had that kind of change in perspective uh with your time out west yeah you know um financial services at least my experience financial services companies outside of the island of Manhattan had a little bit of a different cultural feel, perhaps a little bit more balance, work-life balance, a little bit easier, um, but certainly very focused, um, you know, on career objectives and sort of company outcomes. But for me, just moving out to California, it was just, you know, a different cultural experience, you know, the sunny weather and going to the beach and you had those opportunities in the LA area that you could, in the, in the wintertime, you could snow ski in the morning and then go to the beach in the afternoon. So. <laughs> We, we took advantage of plenty of those uh, opportunities and you have to get you have to get comfortable in waking up very early rob because the market's still open at the regular time but with the time difference you know you find yourself on the highway at you know 3 45 in the morning driving to work but you have the opportunity to be on the golf course at you know three in the afternoon so it was an interesting experience and i uh i'm certainly glad that i did it yeah 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 some some early mornings for sure but i guess you're beating the, the la traffic a little bit by by doing yes. it that way but yeah, yeah you, do, I'm you, sure. do not, you do not want to be driving through la in uh, rush hour it's not a yeah not no, a good thing. definitely not yeah. <laughs> definitely not well we'll bring it back to to today. Um, yeah. So, you know, maybe for our audience, just talk about what are some of the key responsibilities that you have as CIO sure. at New York Life and overseeing enterprise technology for obviously one of the largest life insurers globally? Um, you know, the the title chief information officer, in my experience means slightly different things to different companies and different people. Um, when I try to explain what I do to a living for a living to my wife and my kids, I, I usually use some form of a joke that Everything in a building that has power that's not a light bulb ultimately is my responsibility. And and breaking that down a little bit, um, so certainly all of infrastructure for New York Life, so all of our data centers, compute, networking, telephony, help desk, um, et cetera. Uh, we're very focused on protecting New York Life and the data of our customers and agents, so cybersecurity uh, and, and the work that we do that to protect the company is directly within my remit. Um, enterprise data. Uh, New York Life is very heavily focused to be a data-driven organization and to provide, you know, customized, personalized experiences for our customers and our agents. So enterprise data is a huge focus for us. And then, of course, you have the engineering teams that face off with our business partners to build and develop and integrate 
capabilities that run the company every day from you know sales and marketing comp opportunities to building new products to servicing customers and agents and all that so that that is where you get into the traditional software engineering and integration and etc and then a company of our size and a technology group of our size it's sort of running a small country so we have a office of the cio where i have a chief operating officer that helped me run the group which you know deals with the finances of the of the department and resource management risk management issue management things along those lines so it's sort of the all in job and you know in in some ways that's you know terrifying that the whole thing is yours but frankly having domain over all of it really gives us the scale and the oversight and the power to you know move the needle on the things that matter most for the company and it's really exciting you know the the company recognizes I'm sure we'll get into in the rest of the podcast that you know technology is so critical um, to not only what we're doing here at New York Life, but everyday life for, you know, citizens uh, across this great country. So we're really excited to be a part of it. Yeah, no, really appreciate the overview. And yeah, I mean, it's so uh, vast, uh, the responsibilities yeah. of a CIO. I think that's what's uh, hard. Somebody that's been really on the business side my whole career and obviously worked with CIOs and and folks on that side and, and know how important they are, but yet, you know, not having to worry about or keeping the lights on all the infrastructure, whatever, like have the, the luxury, right. Of, of a lot of that is, I don't have to worry about the plumbing, right. Uh, yes. in, in terms of, uh, kind of the infrastructure, everything and, and you do in your, your seat. So I definitely appreciate there's a whole yeah, lot, you, a lot of stuff you, you don't see from a business perspective that is still critical, right. For the organization. The, the, the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes to keep the lights on every day, uh, like gravity, is uh, not to be underestimated, you know, when you have complicated systems and multiple SaaS providers and, you know, cybersecurity, bad actors trying to do nefarious things at every hour of every day. Um, a, a lot of people work really hard to protect the company and we, we really do a fantastic job. It, it reminds me, and you were saying that as, you know, back to my bond math days when I was at BlackRock, there was this term that like, that job is negatively convexed, like there's only downside. Like you don't want to be in, in technology when people realize who you are when there's a problem. So part of my job is I, I like to be a little bit on the quiet side because things are working smoothly and you know, everything is up and running. But, you know, we're, we're really focused on engaging deeply with our business partners to to facilitate innovation and the way in which we build our systems and interface with our customers. So that part. I'm more than happy to be in the spotlight for. Yeah, no, really appreciate that. And, and you're right. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's one of those that perfection is par for the course, right? That's the expectation. Correct. And then when everything does go wrong, right, uh, to your point, it's like that's when people start uh, you know, learning the names of you and the folks in your organization. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah that, that can be a challenging position for sure. Um, so, uh, Bill, you've mentioned that uh, our crack research staff at the InsureTech podcast dug up a, an interview that you've previously given that New York Life is in the middle of a multi-year strategy to modernize your technology infrastructure and application. And that that plan is focused on three key areas, cloud computing, cybersecurity, and data management. So I would love for you to just yeah. share a little bit more on that and kind of expand for our listeners and viewers. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And you know, I'm sure folks listening to this podcast would probably agree with me that it's uh, it's really exciting time to be a technologist these days. It's just an explosion of innovation that's happening around us. Um, but to be a technologist at New York Life is even more special because we are attempting and very successfully embracing this explosion of technology to modernize the company. And we're doing this really health in a very healthy way in lockstep with our business partners and with the support of our executive management team down to really drive transformation at the company. And when I mentioned those comments um, in another forum at the, about those three areas of our strategy, what I was really referencing is this concept of having a healthy digital core. If you're aspiring as a company to provide best of breed experiences for your customers, for your prospects, for your agents. It's almost akin to building, you know, the walls on a house, but if you don't have a good foundation, the house aren't the walls aren't going to stand very well. So in our view, having modern infrastructure, meaning out of our locally maintained data centers and into the cloud in a modern way, embracing data as an asset and seeking ways to not only cleanse it and rationalize it, but to unlock the value of it and then protecting 
the company from cybersecurity threats. Without that digital core, everything else starts, the house of cards proverbially starts falling. And even in the cybersecurity space where we focus on it, you know, once you start moving your compute into the cloud and your edge moves outside, you know, the historical um, you know, comfort you would get with a robust firewall, it goes away. Now your front line of defense are things like identity and access management. So there's this very interesting convergence of as we're looking to modernize the company, the ways that we've protected the company, the ways that we've managed data has to evolve along with it. So we're, we're trying to, to do that while simultaneously working with our business partners. And this is a really exciting part of the job. You know, if there's probably you know, many examples where companies have technology organizations and they're deemed as a necessary evil. And there are other companies that have technology organizations and they're viewed as a necessary enabler for the business strategy. At New York Life, we're the latter. So we're trying to thread the needle, Rob, to sort of quickly establish this foundation, this digital core, while at the same time working on business partners to figure out ways to leapfrog the competition and create best of breed customer and agent experiences that all of us can be very proud for. So as you probably can imagine, it's a uh, it's a difficult balancing act, but uh, we think we have it under control. And that's what I was referencing when I talked about those three areas of our modernization journey. I definitely want to get into uh, some of those elements in, in a moment, sure. but you kind of touched on the business alignment piece. So um, I know that the business alignment is, is critical is, is, you know, essential in your role. And it can also be very challenging. I know very early in my career, Bill, like one of the things that I had, I think I had an analyst title, but essentially I was almost like a translator. You know, I would meet with the, yes. you know, the actual team, the finance team and others. And then I would meet with our, our kind of IT team. And I realized that these two groups, like really don't have that much in common. They don't have a common language. They don't have a common understanding. And so I, I knew enough about each role just to be dangerous enough. So I wasn't a credentialed actuary and I definitely wasn't a yeah. you know, certified database administrator or whatever, but yet I could help you know, bring these two groups together to, 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 you know, so that, that, that one could support the other and drive the business needs. So I'm just kind of curious, like, how do you, and I feel like quite frankly, Bill, and you may disagree with this, that you know, many organizations I've been part of like that gap between business and IT has almost only grown over time um, because there are so many different yeah. partners. And it, it, so yeah. anyway, um, yeah, just curious your thoughts on that. If an organization doesn't crack this code and bring those stakeholders together in a very healthy and productive way, that that's the festering for you know forty million dollar five year projects being deployed and it's not doing what the end user ultimately wanted and it's a big loss. Like this is the sort of stuff that ends people's careers and books are written about. So to me, that alignment, like I work pretty hard and sort of insist that we won't move forward with something until I observe that that alignment is clear and everyone's on the same page. And we've taken some pretty interesting and strong steps, Rob, to ensure that here at New York Life. So um, specifically, we've made some recent adjustments in both our operating model and our organizational structure here at the company, not just within technology, but within technology and the business in order to achieve what we're talking about right now. And that specifically is a previous alignment that used to be driven largely by product. So life, annuity, long-term care, et cetera. And what was happening in those, in that operating model, that we would be developing and building sort of customer experiences in silos. And if you were interfacing with New York Life, it would feel as if you're interfacing with three different companies because each product silo solved things its own way. We reorganized technology and reorganized the business in more of a value stream construct in the sense that now we have super teams of technology and business partners together in a single group whose responsibility is ensuring, for example, the application experience for our customers from the moment they agree to purchase a policy all the way through underwriting, through issuance, is done consistently across all product lines. And we're doing that when, like, so the jerseys that are people, people aren't wearing technology jerseys and business jerseys. They're wearing the jersey of that value stream. And it's almost hard to tell, frankly, who the technologist is and who the business partner is because everyone's uniquely aligned to the same set of outcomes. And it's been remarkable. The amount of friction that's come out of the system and the pure alignment 
those things are what usually makes projects go sideways. And we've we've you know taken some pretty big steps, and we're, we're seeing some really interesting early returns. That's really great to hear, Bill. I, I love the concept of kind of wearing the same jersey. And I would see that the teams that I've been a part of that were the most effective. That was very much you, you couldn't necessarily tell what fiefdom right each person came from like each had their own unique set of expertise and knowledge that they brought to it but yet you know it was so highly collaborative right that you couldn't necessarily pigeonhole well you're part of you know this organization within the broad broader company and things like that so i I think that's a great analogy and and way to articulate that um so very quickly you know i wanted to ask uh we'll look at ahead at 2024 in a minute here but you know, in the description of the strategy, it, it it seems to me it's like that old analogy of you're building the plane as you're flying it, right? So yes. you, you you have trains up and running, you have to worry about you know keeping that. Then you have to worry about like external threats from a cyber, but yet you also have to look forward for this modernization. And then, frankly, even going beyond when I think of modernization, sometimes I think of taking you know, legacy tech, right? Tech debt maybe have built up, like bring it back to current day standards, but yes. almost distinct from being investing in right, the next 10 years in the future. So I would just yes. love your thoughts about how do you, from if I'm thinking about, right, <laughs> from you talking about asset management portfolio standpoint, how do you decide yeah. how much resources to invest in kind of the, the keep the trains running, protect the house, modernization, and then actually looking forward to the future, maybe some innovation type efforts? A wholesome answer to that could take an hour. I mean, that is <laughs> that is uh, that is incredibly complicated, and that that's the dilemma that most large enterprises are trying to solve, right? I mean, you have multiple complicated problems happening simultaneously, each one individually very complicated in its own regard. So, um, the 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 secret sauce that we think will help us navigate that challenge is effectively twofold. Number one is really crisp planning around bringing together business architecture, technology architecture, and data architecture all together. At the begin, at the end of the day, if we're all not on the same page, like for example, if our business partners want to wake up some new capability that's gonna help our ultimate corporate strategy, well, how do you wanna do that? Are you gonna partner with another company to whitelist a service? Are you gonna buy a third party product to do that for you? Do you want me and my team to build it? Like these fundamental decisions have meaningful ramifications on the technology architecture that we're going to need in order to achieve that and then associated data. Once you start having a clear picture that everyone can point to, you print it up on a big screen and you slap it all around the building and everyone understands that to be your true north, then those other decisions about, okay, we have some technical debt in this pocket of the organization, what do we do about it? Well, it's naturally going to be decommissioned as part of this future state architecture. So maybe we can ring fence it temporarily. Other pieces of it represent something that's gonna persist and we need to invest. So in my, in my humble view, absent that holistic end-to-end strategic strategy around business data and technology architecture, you're by definition, by definition in some form of flail mode and that's inherently dangerous. So you need to have that. And then number two, it's all about planning. You need to be highly organized and whatever organizational construct you use, whether it's traditional waterfall project management with you know a PMO office, whether you lean into scaled agile or other more contemporary ways of working, sequencing that work in a very transparent way. And you're not just scheduling the work within one team. You're, you're very thoughtfully scheduling the work across teams so that interdependencies are understood. Like that, that we, you know, admittedly, I would say the alignment with the business and the standing up of these value streams we're very mature at. Mastering what I just described and walking that walk every single day is still a bit of a journey for us, but um, we're excited and we think we're on the right track. And, you know, the, uh, the, the frequency of projects being questioned of whether we should start it, have started them or the speed by which things get developed or you know, a miss on the requirements versus what's delivered have dropped precipitously since we started adopting this model. So we feel very encouraged. I don't know if that makes sense. 
Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think it's good that you're even looking to those metrics, trying to capture those, right? Um, and ultimately, you know, measuring, getting a sense of the alignment and how well that we did and yeah. not to, because I don't know that every organization does that. So I think that's that's critical in terms of moving fast, right? And not having that rework and just constant churn, uh, basically, where it's one yeah. step forward, two steps back. Uh, it so also happens into- if, you make a, if you make a mistake with that too, you start losing some of the trust and credibility that you've earned with the business partners and then you know the easy things become hard and the hard things become impossible right you, you need to kind of build that positive momentum and you're almost only as good as your last quarter of delivery so we're we're really laser focused to consistently deliver with excellence and be very transparent because then it then it creates a much more um healthy partnership and people feel comfortable to be in the proverbial canoe together. So glad you mentioned that because I've actually had the um, experience in terms of leading innovation team where we kind of had a small pool of money, right, to make some small bets to answer some fundamental right. questions where when I started, the team was actually had several issues, uh, several technologies that were in what I would describe maintenance mode. Like one, for example, was they had done some pilots with robotic process automation and they yeah. were stuck because they hadn't included their IT partners, so they couldn't really scale it, right, and, and make sure right. they got that blessing. But yet they were worried, hey, if we end this pilot, we unplug it. Now we've got an unhappy business area that's come to rely on that technology. And so we had several examples where we were almost a, a shadow IT, right? And so to your point, sometimes yeah. business partners, when they don't feel like – their CIO and the, the IT team is, is responsive, they find workarounds. They find other ways that maybe in the short run, right, adds to some productivity of a particular pain point, but in the long run actually is counterproductive. Can I expand on that for a second? I totally Please. agree. This maybe one more point because I, I think this is one of the critical success factors as a technologist to really be welcomed and embraced by the business. And I've, I've had this learning through my career and it, it happened in other forms as well. If you, if an individual has really creative, innovative ideas about, you know, fundamentally transforming some business process, a line of business, but production is down every day or their systems issues or the cost of operationally running technology is out of control. It, you, you're not going to be met with a positive reception when you speak to decision makers, because you seem as if you're missing the boat. The b- much better way to do it is to first get your own house in order, you know, get production stability to an all-time high, make it like gravity, create, bring your run costs down, improve culture in the company, drive innovation, you know, hard work ethic, transparency, say what you say, say what you know, do what you say, say what you do, all that. And then what happens is instead of being, instead of asking for an audience, people seek you out. I, I say this to my children all the time. That you know they might get disappointed that they didn't get invited to a holiday party or a Christmas party. It's like, well, what what could you be doing as an individual so that that person wouldn't have the party if you weren't available? Because that's much that's a much more powerful way to do that. So I've taken that to heart, and you know, certain business pockets of our organization that historically has leaned towards a little bit of a you know black market tech up you know <laughs> model have now broken that down and are seeking actively our help in doing things the right way, which I think is a huge signal that we must be onto something positive. Yeah. Yeah. That's tremendous. That's, that's fantastic to hear. Yeah. Uh, so looking yeah. forward, Bill, uh, top priorities, and, and I'll, I'll kind of make this a, a two part question. So, yeah. you know, in general, right. Kind of knowing our audience, most of them probably don't work at New York life. They work in other organizations. So just from a CIO's sure. perspective, broadly, <clears throat> what do you think are some top level priorities? And then secondarily, right specific to you and your role at New York Life, what are your key priorities for 2024? Yeah. You know, I, it's it's interesting. Um, although things are moving very quickly, and they are, especially around generative AI, et cetera, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, there's also some common truths that I think are just persistent in this role that you need to focus on. So for me, you know, not losing focus around resiliency for the company, you know, production support, disaster recovery, cybersecurity protection. We talked extensively so far around ensuring tight alignment with your business partners and making sure everyone's on the same page about what you're trying to deliver and what it is um, and what it isn't. Um, you know, 
definitely in the insurance domain. I, we feel it here at New York Life, and I suspect that's true for other domains as well, that there is a huge um, desire to digitize and modernize experiences across a whole spectrum of avenues, and that costs money. Um, so this creates an interesting dynamic that technologists are often going to be looked to to find ways of doing more with less or more with the same at a minimum, not only within your own department and technology, which often is a sizable expense component of an overall enterprise, but how can the technology department offer cost efficiency opportunities within the business itself so that capital can be generated, capital can be preserved for more strategic initiatives. So the combination of all that is, I think, is persistent. It hasn't really changed meaningfully over the years, but in 2024, I think it's going to remain front and center. For us, in addition to everything we've already talked about, we have been, Rob, very, very purposeful about using um, generative AI not only to um, advance certain aspects of our business, but to use it as an illustrative fact about our intention around embracing modern technology, not just for our, our employees, but our customers and our agents. So, you know, the convergence of data management and generative AI in order to unleash value for us is going to be sort of the, the new, the largest major new component to the broad categories of things that we're focused on in 2024. And if I have a minute, I could tell me we've been on a pretty interesting journey, um, you know, probably about 30 seconds after ChatGPT hit the internet and our CEO got his hands on it. He very astutely called a few of us into the office and said, we need to do something about this. And we challenge ourselves to um, build and implement at least a few custom New York Life generative AI applications and put them out in the hands of our users before year end, which is a pretty aspirational goal considering the newness of the technology and we did not have the necessary infrastructure to do that on day one. And it's it's probably one of the more proud feathers in our cap that we've collectively achieved this. And we're going to have uh, multiple generative AI custom built applications in the hands of different departments of our company to achieve a combination of improved sales into the field, as well as operational efficiencies in departments like service. So it's pretty, pretty cool stuff. And as you probably can imagine, there's a long line out the door of business partners who are looking for similar services. So it's going to be a continued focus in 2024. Yeah, that's uh, it's exciting, right? Technology. We talked about that, James and I, when we recorded our uh, kind of year end wrap up show, certainly, because I do think that was one of the big headliners for 2023. And, you know, it's probably maybe it's hyperbole, maybe it's not, but I mean, it's almost like, you know, we've just discovered the internet, right? Or built the internet, right? And we're kind of starting out and figuring out, okay, we know, what can we use this thing for? And I just feel like there's so many possibilities out there. So we're just at the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it's already remarkable what people have been able to, 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 to showcase and build and deploy, yes. but I just know that we're, you know, a fraction, right, of what's are the possible is over the next five, 10 years or more of using uh, generative AI. There's so many, almost infinite possibilities. I mean, there's, there's been many very prominent people making quotes like that, that this is as big as the internet, and, and many of them basically saying that this isn't hype, and I, I believe that to be true. We, we've seen some very, I think the combination of the power of the tool and the return you can get and the increased accessibility. You know, we, we've had a very established AI, traditional AI data science capability here at New York Life for years. We've been developing our own statistical and predictive models things like underwriting, et cetera, for years. But the difference with this is the simple nature of programmatic interfacing with it, these large language models. You, you can be a general technologist and build something pretty remarkable. You don't need to be a PhD in data science. So I think the combination of that general ease of accessibility and the investment that the big hyperscalers are making, the stuff is moving so quickly. I agree with you. This, It's, it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. So we're, we're we're going to be very thoughtful to try and remain on the bleeding edge. Uh, so, Bill, to wrap up on a personal note, what's been the most rewarding yeah. aspect of your role and what excites you the most about the future of technology in the insurance industry? Yeah, I mean, Rob, for me, um, you know, life's all about timing and you have to find the right fit. You know, so personally, 
New York Life is an unbelievable institution to work for. I mean, here you have the benefit of a 178-year-old institution with a culture uh, you know, as steep and stable as the bedrock in New York City. And at the same time, within the walls, we're attempting to redefine ourselves as a bit of a startup and move very nimbly and drive innovation. So the combination of those two things are wonderful. What also gives me great satisfaction every day is knowing that the business that we're in, I mean, New York Life provides a societal good effectively to our customers, especially focusing on the middle market who historically have not, who've been underserved by traditional financial services institutions. So the ability to bring new capabilities that helps our agents reach more households to help them and to help them more effectively has been very rewarding. And the commitment from the top, the necessary funding to move the needle. And I've inherited a really amazing leadership team and we've come together in a really fantastic way. And when when you have all that converge and you actually just like the people you're working with and you're making a lot of progress and the work you're doing is satisfied and the roadmap is really exciting, like it doesn't feel like work. It's it's frankly fun. And um, this is where we are. And um, And then the last thing I'll say, what's interesting about New York Life being a mutual that you know, we, we make long-term investments, we make long-term bets. So this is not a scenario where all of these initiatives may get unplugged because of you know next quarterly earnings if we're a public company. We, we're sticking with the strategy, we have the long-term commitment, we have the capital in order to do that. So that combination of innovation plus stability plus doing a societal good for me has just been, um, it's been unbelievable, re- unbelievably rewarding, and I'm humbled to have the position that I'm in to be a small part of it. Oh, that's fantastic, Bill. It's, uh, we could go on yeah. for a lot longer, but uh, we'll have yeah. to end it there. But it, it's been fantastic to talk to you. Uh, it's so great to get your perspective, to learn a little bit about you, your background, and, and how you've come to this role and the great work that you're doing at New York Life, and uh, as well as a kind of appreciation, right, of the the challenge in your, your day-to-day job. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's an amazing time, right, to be alive with so many emerging technologies. I mean, we've we've seen a lot in our lifetimes, but every day, every year, it just feels like, you know, there's, there's new possibilities out there. So it's yeah. a, a really exciting time. Well, great. Well, listen, thanks very much for having me. I, I enjoyed the conversation and uh, happy to come back another time if there's interest. That would be great. We'd love to have you come back maybe when you get a little bit more experience with Gen AI and some other technologies sure. and kind of catch up and, and see what your progress has been to date on uh, helping to, 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 you know, keep a venerable uh i mean just what a great name right new york life is one that everybody knows it's got a fantastic yeah. history and keep you guys you know kind of relevant and and uh providing your customers with outstanding experiences you've always done so thank you for that yeah. and well, thanks listen, to, happy holidays to you and your family and we'll I'll, I'll figure out a way to send you a new york Knicks jersey down there to texas oh uh, that would be fantastic yeah we uh, <laughs> uh, san antonio uh somehow the spurs started uh, three and two and we ended three and 20 even though we've got yes. victor Wembanyama. so it's a uh, tough sliding down here but uh you know hopefully we're also making investments that will pay off in the yes. long term <laughs> Yes. All right, sir. All the best. All right. Well, thanks, Bill. And thanks to you for the audience uh, for uh, geeking out uh, with our interview with Bill Cassidy from New York Life. See you next time. This has been the Insure Tech Geek Podcast powered by JB Knowledge, jbknowledge.com. The Insure Tech Geek Podcast is all about technology that's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. I've been your host, James Benham. That's jamesbenham.com with co-host Rob Galbraith at endofinsurance.com. Thank you for joining us today. Look forward to meeting up again. We're taking you on a journey through InsureTech. So enjoy the ride and geek out.